Alain, thank you. Glad you're here tonight. Glad you're here the other nights too, but especially this <laughs> night. Right? That's great. Well, the book of Philippians, please, chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. What manner of persons ought we to be? We're learning tonight that we are to be content. Content. Philippians 4, notice with me if you will. Check this too, Dean. Make sure this is right, okay? It doesn't sound right tonight for some reason. Um, verse number 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture here this evening. And as we open up your word and study it together tonight, God, I pray that you'd help us to focus. Lord, help each one of us to put out of our mind uh, other concerns, other cares, things that would capture our thoughts and cause us to miss what your Spirit might say to us this evening. And so, Lord, help us each one to... Listen carefully and give us all ears to hear what you would want to say to your church this evening. And help us to grasp, Lord, this, this concept and this great truth of being content. Lord, we'll thank you for what you'll do, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Contentment makes poor men rich, and discontent will make rich men poor. Benjamin Franklin said that. Contentment is all about being satisfied. It's all about being satisfied. The word content literally means to be enough. To be enough. <coughs> it means to suffice. In other words, it has to, be, it has to do with being content with what's available. It, 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 it's a word that comes from, we get our word container from it. So it's, it's within limits to be held and, and it's, 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 it's an evasive thing for Americans particularly uh, to be content. A Quaker was watching his new neighbor move in next door. Of course, he's leaning on the fence, watching all the modern appliances, all the electronic gadgets, all the plush furniture being carried in. And finally, he called out to his new neighbor and he waved him over. And he said, I just want to tell you that if you're lacking anything, just let me know, and I'll show you how to live without it. <laughs> Maybe we all need that lesson. But Paul says here, I'm going to speak in verse 11, not in respect of want, but I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He said, I've, I, that's an amazing statement he made. But we understand that he, he said, I've, I've learned something. To be content regardless of my situation. To be content regardless of my circumstances. Regardless of the possessions that I have or I do not have. Contentment. Paul was well qualified to write on the subject. Now, the Spirit of God chose him, I think, because of his situation. They knew he's writing this letter from jail, from prison. And uh, how can a guy in prison say, I'm content? I, 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 I am satisfied. I'm okay with where I am. Now, you think about Paul, and think about, uh, well, most of the time we don't think about how he grew up, but if you remember, he said he grew up at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the premier teacher of the day. Uh, Paul grew up a pretty privileged life. He had the best in education. He was a Roman citizen. His family had many privileges. He, I don't know if, if he had the silver spoon in his mouth, but it was pretty close. Uh, he knew what privilege was. He had, it, he had it made as far as some people would look at him. And now, he doesn't have any of that. So he knows what it is, and that's what he, I think he meant when he said, I know, I know uh, how to not just be a base, I know how to abound. 
I've been on that side of things, he said, but I know how to be a base as well. I know how to have a full stomach, but I know how to have an empty stomach. He said, I know, I know. Paul said, hey, I know what it's like to be surrounded by loving Christians and people who encourage you, and I also know what it's like to be abandoned by everybody. When Paul said, my first answer, no man stood with me. Just as all the disciples forsook Jesus and fled, Paul had the men forsake him and flee too. And he was all by himself. And so uh, here's a guy, he, he, knew what it, he knew what it was to be healthy, but he also knew what it was to have a thorn in his flesh that he asked God to take away. And God said, no, you're going to keep that uh, because you'll rely upon me if you have that. You see, so you, you, you can follow Paul's example of contentment regardless of the things that God allows into our life. Now I know as Americans that's tough. In fact, even when we read the Bible and we read, give us this day our what? Daily bread. That's somebody praying for daily food. I don't know everybody in the room, obviously, but I don't know that there's anybody in the room that had to pray, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to eat today. Now, you may have had to decide what out of the cupboard do I want. Or you may have had to decide, will it be Wendy's, Taco Bell, you know, McDonald's, where, where is it going to be? But it's not a matter of, I don't have anything to eat, and I don't have any means to get it. Lord, I need daily bread. We don't, we don't understand that in America. We don't, we don't, we don't. It's very difficult for us to pray a prayer like that and understand what we're talking about. And so we, when God says he promises to give us what we need or, or what will suffice us, we're more inclined to say, God, give me what I want. We, most of us aren't looking at what will get us by. We have more than what we need to get by. And until you... Until you go out and, and, and travel in other places of the world, you don't understand how, how most of the world does not have what you and I have in our houses tonight. You go home and, uh, and my wife just went to Aldi's today. Who shops at Aldi's? Anybody shop at Aldi's? Oh, quite a few of you do. And uh, she come in and she announced that she had the groceries and she says, well, I, this, should, this should last this till, and I don't know what date she said, but she said some date. Don't tell her I didn't know the date. Just tell her I do that. You know, I just heard her. Never mind. But uh, <laughs> getting get in trouble here by using that illustration. I don't know where I went there for, but, uh, you know, it's saying we're, we're going to have the food now that's going to last us for 10 days or whatever it's going to be. You know, most of the world can't live that way and doesn't live that way. And so, you know, we, 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 we have plenty. It's hard to say that I just have enough. We have more than enough. We have more. Hey, and even when it comes to spiritual things, how many of you, how many of you have, you have a Bible with you tonight, but you have others at home that you didn't bring? Look at that. Isn't that amazing? And, I, and, and we all do. And, and, and yet there's people in India that will get their first Bible they've ever had in their life. You see, we have, we have plenty. And so uh, it, is, it is difficult for us to handle, difficult for us to learn contentment. Okay? And so uh, Paul is going to help us here. How can we learn true contentment? How can that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked me because that's what we want to look at tonight, all right? The answer lies in, in four different things. Number one, number one, it lies in our position. Our position. It's our position or our persuasion, and, and that is, notice what he said in verse number 10 before he got to verse 11. He said in verse number 10, but I rejoiced, what's the next three words, church? In the Lord greatly, that now at the last year care of me at first again wherein you're also careful but you lacked opportunity i rejoiced in the lord greatly i'm well, saying i'm uh, it's my faith in god that causes me to rejoice it's the position i have in christ that's why he could say verse 11 that i've learned of what service state i'm in therewith be content because my rejoicing my joy is in the lord that's my position Remember we talked about Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, where? 
in Christ. How, how many spiritual blessings? No, some. No, most. A lot? No, all. Man, you're rich. So am I. But I'm rich in Christ. All spiritual blessings in Him. So he's rejoicing that he has fellowship with Christ. He's rejoicing that he's in Christ. He's rejoicing in what God has done for him. And our, listen, it's our union with Christ. It's our position in Christ that allows us to enjoy the things of the world, the things that God has given to us in this world. That's why he told Timothy that he, God's given us all things richly to enjoy. But we enjoy them because of who we are in Christ. That's how we get enjoyment from them. And they're not empty blessings. You know, a group of geography students were studying the seven wonders of the world. And at the end of the lecture, the students were asked to list what they considered to be the present day seven wonders of the world. Although there was some disagreement, the following got the most votes. Number one, the Great Pyramids of Egypt. Number two, the Taj Mahal. Number three, the Grand Canyon. Number four, the Panama Canal. Number five, the Empire State Building. Number six, St. Peter's Basilica. And number seven, the Great Wall of China. While gathering the votes, the teacher noted that one student, a quiet girl, hadn't turned in her paper. So she asked the girl, are you having trouble with your list? And the little girl said, yes, a little. She said, I couldn't quite make up my mind because there's so many possibilities. And the teacher said, well, tell us what you have and... Maybe we can help you. And then the girl stood up and read, I think the seven wonders of the world are to touch, to taste, to see, to hear. And then she hesitated for a moment, and then she said, to hope, to laugh, and to love. Wow. The room became silent. You see... It's so easy for us to look at the exploits of man and say how wonderful it is and overlook the works of God and how wonderful He is. And we're so prone to do that and we overlook the amazing things that God has done. Life, life is amazing. Life is, is, is just miraculous. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's, it's, an, it's just an amazing thing. And, and, and we ought to notice it and declare it to God. And it's a, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. Hey, there's, there, there's half the world has not heard of Jesus Christ yet. They, they've never heard a presentation of the gospel. And if you told them the name of Jesus, they wouldn't know who that is. But we do. And what did you have to do with that? Nothing. You were just born here. Huh? And, and you, you were not only born here, but you were born and, and you were born around people that you heard about Christ. I was born into a family where my dad was saved and took us to church. I didn't have any say in that. But that's where God put me. Praise the Lord. I could have got put in a family that had nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Christianity, and never been in church. You see? So thank God for what he's done. Thank God for the, the path that he's put you on in his life. Be aware every day of things that are truly wondrous. As the songwriter said, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Well, take time to do that of what God has done. It says it will surprise you. It ought not to surprise us, but it does. And so uh, Jesus said, Jesus said, I've come that they might have what? life and they might have it more abundantly you know a lot of people are, are I, I, I'm afraid a lot of people just exist and they're not really living life oh I know the world looks at someone who's the athlete that's got millions of dollars and you know they're, they're they, they say oh they're living the life no they're not no they're not Christians live the life Christians live the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We make a big deal about, hey, he's, did he say he's a way? Did he say one of the ways? No, he's 
the way. But wait a minute. He didn't say he's one of the lives or, or one of the many ways of life. He said, no, I'm the life. So life is Christ. That's why Paul would write in Philippians earlier, he said, for to me to live is Christ. Boy, never forget. Don't, 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 don't forget your position. You're in Christ Jesus. Boy, that's contentment there. All right? So Paul was content because of his position. And what was his position? In Christ. Okay? Number two, the, re- the way we can be content is our perspective. Our perspective. Notice with me verse 11. He said, not that I speak in respect of one, I, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I mean, didn't the stress of his situation cause him worry? I'm sure he appreciated their generosity. They had sent him a gift. The church at Philippi was a great missionary church. But you notice Paul says, I had to, I had to learn contentment. I have learned. Did you get that? And so I had to learn to get a right perspective. You know, contentment is not natural to us. And it's not just us. Mankind, I'm talking about. We're, we're, we're just, we have that discontent. Henry Kissinger, who's the former Secretary of State, said this, To Americans, tragedy is wanting something very badly and not getting it. Tragedy is wanting something very badly and not getting it. But many people have had to learn that perhaps the worst form of tragedy is wanting something badly, getting it, and finding it empty. Dion Sanders, who has professed faith in Christ, he told about his testimony. And he accepted Christ after he, they, the, he was with the Cowboys at the time and they won the Super Bowl. And they won the Super Bowl and he was named MVP. And in those days, they got a Corvette or something from Chevrolet. And he said, I'm laying in my bed. It's the wee hours of the morning. All the celebration, the party's over. I'm laying in my bed. The cars in my driveway were the you know, Super Bowl champs of the world. And I lay in my bed and I think, is this it? Empty. Empty inside. You see? He understood that. Hey, here he is. Uh, I'm... I think it was uh, Brady when he won the first Super Bowl. He said, is, is this it? Is this all there is? I've reached a pinnacle of my profession. I've reached the height of what anybody in my profession can obtain, and it didn't fill the void. It was empty. Listen, don't, don't get, the, get the right perspective on what life's all about. Paul said, I had to learn to be content. I had to learn... How, how, what was important. And I had to learn uh, to, to understand what I had and, and what my blessings were. It's kind of like the old cow that, that is in the pasture and, and, and it's always trying to stick its neck through the fence and grab some grass on the other side of the fence. That's where that saying goes, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And he doesn't realize the nice pasture he has and the nice water he has and all the things that have been provided for him on his side of the fence. We can get that way sometimes. We get very discontent with our own life and we get to thinking grass is greener on the other side of the fence. I'll never forget years ago, Irma Bombeck. Anybody remember Irma Bombeck? She's a writer and she's a real funny writer. And uh, I remember an article I saw. She used to be the newspaper. and we used to. Anybody remember newspapers? And, uh, yeah, some of you do. Okay. And uh, they used to have an article in there, and, and she said, the grass is always greener over the septic tank. So uh, I never forgot that. I said, anytime you think the grass is greener, you better check to see what's underneath there. And uh, don't be discontent. Listen, uh, look, at, look at a scripture with me, will you? Go back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. We'll come back to Philippians 4. Look at Hebrews 13 with me, will you? Most of us know this verse. We know it for the end of the verse. Hebrews 13 and verse number 5. We know the last phrase of the verse, right? For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And we like to quote that, I'll never leave you nor forsake thee. And that's true, but wait a minute. 
where did that verse start? Look at verse 5. Look at the start of it. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be, what? Content with such things as ye have. For He hath said, that's Jesus, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The whole reason I can be content is because my perspective is I have Jesus. And if Jesus is never going to leave me or forsake me, I'll be okay. I'll be all right. <laughs> He's going to take care of me. And I trust Him. That's, that's my, my, my perspective that, that He'll take care of me. He says, I, I know you have need of all these things. And He knows that you have need of those things. So keep the right perspective. Quit looking at the things you don't have and remember who you do have. You have Jesus Christ. And He will never leave you nor forsake you. And He promises to supply our every need. And then, when you listen, when you have that, you'll begin to appreciate how green the grass is on your side of the fence and how nice it is what the Lord has done. Listen, the Lord has allowed us the freedom to choose our own attitude in our circumstances. We have that freedom. There's an Austrian psychiatrist who died on September 2nd at the age of 91. And during World War II, he was imprisoned at Auschwitz where he was stripped of his identity as a medical doctor and was forced to work as a common laborer. His father, his mother, his brother, his wife, they all died in the concentration camp. All of his notes, which, which represented, oh, excuse me, represented his life's work, were destroyed. Yet he came out of there and out of that concentration camp and he said this, quote, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of all human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. You have your choice of how you're going to respond to whatever circumstances you have. You can't choose your circumstances always. But you can choose your attitude in those circumstances. You do have the choice. And Paul said, I've learned whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. You always have a choice. And listen, your choice makes all the difference in the world. How you're going to view it makes all the difference in the world. The right attitude is your choice. The right attitude is me having the right perspective towards my circumstances. And, and here's, here's the right perspective. Who's with me? Jesus Christ is. His promise is that He'll work all things together for good to them that love God. Now, if He's got to work it together for good, that means not everything that happens, well, I think, is good. But if He's going to use it to conform me to the image of His Son, then it's good. It's okay. Because it's good in his sight. And, and listen, it doesn't matter what you go through as long as, it, as long as he's there to go through it with you. That's the difference. All right? So keep the right perspective. Then number three is our priorities. Here's our priorities, and that's verse number 12 of Philippians chapter 4. I know both, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Most people think that learning how to live in abundance would not be too tough. Say, I think I could, I could handle that. I think, I think it, they think, man, you know what? It would be easy to be content if I just had more stuff. That's what they think. I was interesting, I was reading some things this week. And they're, they're talking about the, the American dream. And they said, for people who make $25,000 a year or less, the American dream to them was making $54,000 a year. But to those who made, what was it, over $80,000 or $90,000 a year? And he said, to them, they, they asked them how much they need to make to have the American dream. They needed to make $192,000. You understand? It doesn't matter where you are. It's about double 
what you have. That's how much you, you need to get to, to, to have the, to, then I'd be content. And so many people chase that all of their life. And, and they just keep adding things, and, and you see it. Why, why, do we have, why do we have all the storage places? Because people have so much stuff, they can't even fit it in their house. People have $1,000 worth of junk in their garage and they got $30,000 automobile, dollar automobiles sitting out in their driveway. Better off to put all that junk out in your driveway and put your car in the garage. Think about that. Abundance is a more searching test of a man's true quality than scarcity or having little. All you have to do is go to the more prosperous areas of our community. Just, just go down to where the homes are 300, 400, half a million dollars. And just, just sit on a Sunday morning and see how many of those cars are pulling out and going to church. Hmm? Not very many. Knock on their door and tell them how you need Jesus. I remember a pastor up in Illinois was tell me one time that, that not far from his church they had such a development. Uh, all of them half million dollar homes and up. And he knocked on the door one time and a guy actually answered. And he was trying to tell him that he, his need of Christ. And the guy looked right at him and he said, I have a four car garage. I have a motor home. I have a boat. I have a, a 12,000 some square foot house. He says, tell me again why I need God. It's exactly his words. Tell me again why I need God. You see? Yeah, you and I know the answer to that. But you understand? Uh, I think far, for uh, someone said this, and I agree. For one man who will stand prosperity, there's a hundred that will stand adversity. I think it's a much more searching test to stand prosperity than it is to stand adversity. It's a great thing to learn to do without, like the old Quaker friend at the beginning of the message. You know, most of us don't really have to think about what we do without. We have so many conveniences. We have so many things now, especially that we didn't used to have. Some of you, some of you came to think, what, what would I do without a remote? But there are those of us in the room, remember, you got up and walked up to the thing and turned the channel. Now, granted, we only had three or four to turn to. I realize there's more than that now. But you know, uh, there's, there's everybody, every generation, each succeeding generation seems to raise the contentment bar. We look at, sometimes you drive through older neighborhoods sometimes, and you know the, the, the smaller houses, and you think, how did, they, how did they ever live in that little house? Oh, families lived in that house. Families lived in a house where they had three bedrooms and one bathroom in the hallway. Hmm? Yeah, remember? <laughs> depending on, depending on. How fast and hard you were knocking depend on the urgency of the situation. <laughs> but you understand, that's just that's the way people live. Now, if people go to look at a house and there's not a master bath, they say, oh, I'm not even considering that house. Isn't that true? That's become our standard now, the norm. Uh, everybody's got two cars, at least. Some of you have neighbors. You have, everybody has somebody in the neighborhood that has a used car lot in their parking lot, in their driveway somewhere. All kinds of cars. You wonder, man, how do they get all those cars there? I remember days when family had one car. And, you know, da dad took it to work and mom was home. And it, well, what if something happened? Well, what if something happened? You know, you got a neighbor, you found somebody, and you, you did what you had to do. Now you can't think of somebody saying, well, we've got to have two cars. We, we can't get live without two cars. We, we've raised the bar. 
and we've raised the standard. It's just the way that the way it works. Remember when <laughs> used to? Did you know we used to pick up a phone not knowing who was on the other end? <laughs> How scary is that? You just picked up and said hello. Waited to see who it was. Nothing there to tell you who it was or what the number is or nothing. You just took your chances. And guess what? If you used to call somebody and if they weren't there, you know what it would do? It would just ring and ring and ring and ring and you'd say, I guess they're not home. You know what you did? You hung up and said, I'll call later. When you, when you left, sometimes we, we left so we could get away from the phone. You took a walk so it could be quiet. And now, how many of you have left home, forgot your phone, turned around, and went back and got it? Huh? Okay. Yeah. We can't imagine going anywhere without it. Unbelievable, isn't it? The 21st century has brought all kinds of marvels to our world. But it won't bring contentment. It won't bring contentment. We have to have some priorities. You know what our priorities say? I have enough. I have enough. I, I don't need the next thing. I don't need the newest thing. I don't need the next new gadget. I'm just going to trust God in every situation. See, true contentment's only going to come from the Lord. It won't come from anybody else. I want... I want, I want Christ to be enough for me. That's why, that's why he wrote Timothy. Godliness with contentment. You ever think about that? You mean people aren't going to be aren't going to be contained. They're not going to have enough su- sufficiency. Not going to be satisfied with just godliness. They're going to want more. Well yeah, I want to be godly but I still want well, yeah, yeah, I want godliness, but I, you see? And he's saying, no, no, no. Will you be content? Will that fill your container? Just godliness? Will God be enough? See? Christ is all I need. And a hundred million dollars. Christ is all I need. And a 10,000 square foot house. Oh. Is he enough? Contentment. Our position in Christ, our perspective, is our attitude and our circumstances, our priorities. I have enough. The last one is our power source. Our power source. That's verse 13. So Paul said, here's what it comes down to. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. See, Paul's not taking credit for learning this on his own. He's, I'm not... And he said, it's not something in me. It's not me, some inner fortitude I got that you don't have. Because then we could say, well, yeah, Paul was that way, but man, I'm not that way. No, no, that had nothing to do with, with, with him. It had everything to do with him. It had everything to do with God. He said, I can do all things through Christ. He's the one who empowers me. I'm gonna, he's the one who will strengthen me. The strength comes from the Lord's. We, we endure trials, we endure hardships, we go through the difficulties of life. Not because we're strong enough to bear them, but because He's strong enough to carry us through. And He says, oh, God will never give you more than you can bear. Sure He will. Because He wants you to look to Him. Say, God, I can't do this. And you can't. I got a phone call today. Kimberly, I got a phone call today from a lady. Uh, just for church tonight. And was saying, she just saw, seen the sign out in the yard. Said, you know, I struggle. Said, I, I'll, go, I'll go maybe three days without a drink and then I just fall back. I've never, I never get past three days. Said, I need help. I need help. She's supposed to be here Friday night. And, and I, I'm, you know, people realize, at some point you realize, man, I can't do this. I'm, I'm, I'm losing the battle. And that's not just with addiction. That's with living the Christian life. 
That's being faithful to God. That's teaching your Sunday school class. That's singing in the choir. That's being faithful to church. That's reading your Bible. That's being a testimony at your job. That's all of that. You can't do that on your own. You may for a while, but you know what you do? You do a few days, then you fall down. It won't work. Now, let me help you understand this too. Notice, do you understand now the context? He's talking about contentment. He's talking about uh, how to learn to be content. That's where I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So many people take that verse and they just quote it out of the context as a blanket promise. I can do all things through Christ. Well, wait a minute now. Does that mean you're going to outrun a speeding bullet? No. Does that mean I'll leap tall buildings in a single bound? No. It means I'll go out and dunk the basketball? No. Gravity says that won't happen. So I can't just say, oh, you can do anything that you can do all things through Christ. No. When it comes to being content, I can do all things. Whether it's to be abased, whether it's to abound, no matter what it is that God brings in my life, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. The power that we, we, we receive from Him is always sufficient to do His will. God's grace always sustains us. God doesn't give us superhuman ability to accomplish anything we can imagine without regard to His interests. But as you find out, as you serve God, you face some struggles, you face some trials, you face some difficulties, and you know what? God is going to strengthen you and give you the ability to go through it. Only God can do that. Where you would crumble before, you'll march right on through because of your power source. You're relying on God and not yourself. So that's why, that's why you, have to, you have to establish the relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to, you have to want that that, that, that de- and desire that fellowship with Him every single day. He's your power source. He's what's going to take you through each and every day. That's why it's so vital. You need, we need that more than you need an extra half hour sleep. You really do. Your flesh will say, oh, you need the sleep. Oh, but listen to your spirit saying, no, you need Jesus. You need power today. Oh, listen, your flesh doesn't know what's coming today, but this Holy Spirit says, I know what's coming today. Get out of bed and get in your Bible and get something from God today. That way, your help comes from the Lord. That's the source for your strength. Where's the source of your strength? David said, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. David said, he's the rock of my salvation. David said, he's my strong tower that I run into and I'm safe. All of his help came from God. So our help has to come from. When God allows a burden, he gives grace to bear it. No matter what you face, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your situation, no matter what your trial, you can draw on the power of Christ to help you. You must draw on it to help you. Corey Timboom, and I meant to bring a glove tonight, and I didn't, but Corey Timboom described the reality of Christ empowering us by using a glove. You know, when you think about it, uh, when you have a glove, does somebody have a glove? Anybody wear gloves tonight? It's too warm for that, isn't it? Mary Lou, you wore gloves? Okay. Mary Lou, when you hold your glove up, Mary Lou. There it is. What can that glove do right there? Nothing. That glove only is going to get powerful when she does what? Put your hand in it. Oh. Now it can do anything that hand can do. You know what, Christian? You're the glove. And without Him, we can't do anything. He 
as we yield to Him and we let Him fill us, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But you have to yield and let Him fill you. Is that glove, you, know, you, ever, you ever go to put on a pair of gloves and the fingers are goobered up? For lack of a better word, I hate to use those big Greek words on you, but sometimes I just have to. And, uh, it, and you can't get your fingers in there? Oh, that just feels good, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. You say, man, what's wrong with these things? Huh? You, you, you keep trying to get in there. Why? Because you can't do what you want to do if you can't get your fingers all the way in there. And I wonder how many things, times God's wanted to do something in my life and I haven't let him have full control of me to do what he wants to do. And, and, and he gets so grieved over that. The power source is Christ. And I, I want to make room for his hand to be able to, to fill me and to use me. So his plan is to clean up our lives and to live his life through us. He, he's living through us so his power comes through us. So we live the Christian life not in our power but in his power. He lives through us. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live. Not yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. He's living in me, and He wants to live through it, through you. Allow Him to do that. Now, are you content in your circumstances? Hmm? Paul knew how to be content, whether he had plenty or whether he had little. Because he was looking at things from God's point of view, not his. He focused on what he was supposed to do, not on what he thought he should have. Do you focus on what you should do, or are you focused on what you think you should have? The secret? Drawing on Christ's power. Getting His strength. Getting His power. Are you, are you discontent tonight? Are you a little grumbly because you don't have something you think you deserve? You don't have something you think you ought to have? Desire for better possessions? So often... We, we, we're, we're lo people are longing for things thinking it's going to fill that void. And I'm telling you, only Jesus Christ fills that void. He's the power source. And He's the one that wants to fill that position in your life. You can get all those things, and people do. But they're still empty. They've, they've succeeded and risen to positions and risen to uh, beautiful homes and risen to all kinds of possessions and getting the car that everybody wants or the job everybody wants or making the money everybody wants or taking the vacations everybody wants to take. And they're empty. They're not content. Don't fall into the American trap of always wanting more. Always want more. Ask God to remove that desire and help you to be content. It lies in your position. It lies in your perspective. It lies in your priorities. And it lies in your source of power. Trust Him to supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And let's be content. All right? Let's stand together for prayer. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this evening. And Lord, this is a... This is a a challenging, challenging be for us to be content. Lord, I trust that we would connect together with being content with the fact you will never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, help us to focus on what we have to live for, not just what we have to live with. It's mighty empty to have things to live with, but nothing to live for. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help us to learn to be content.
you do all things well. Lord, we love you. I trust, Lord, that we would always focus on what you have us to do and not just the things that we have, that we possess. For our life does not consist of the things which we possess. Lord, show us who we are in Christ. Help each one of us tonight to leave determined that our our source of power will not be ourselves, but it will be Jesus Christ. Help us to yield ourselves to him as a glove yields to our hand that he might live his life through us and accomplish his will in each one of us. We love you. Thank you for everyone's attention this evening. Lord, dismiss us with your care, please. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing our closing song tonight. We're going to do The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. We'll do that as our closer tonight, all right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God bless you. You are dismissed. No choir.